Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mo, and uh, I'm from Seller. And Seller is a off-chain scaling platform, but today I'm not uh, going to talk uh, too much about our technology side, but more focusing on the crypto economic side of things. Uh, so this is actually a very less uh, research and discuss the topic because, uh, uh, you know, we have been known, like, uh, we, we, we have, uh, we have known, like, uh, how on-chain uh, crypto economy works uh, through proof of uh, uh, work mining, proof of stake, and all that stuff. But how does a off-chain crypto economic works and the related security question is the thing that I'm going to talk about today. But before that, uh, I just want to quickly announce that we just uh, launched our testnet and SDK, and you can actually try out the testnet using our user-facing application called C Wallet. You can download that at get.setter.app. And we also have released SDK, and people have been already building on top of a seller with uh, uh, quite cool applications like uh, gas fee options, uh, off-chain prediction market, and all that stuff. So before I jump into the uh, uh, off-chain, uh, you know, crypto economic aspect, let me just give a quick off-chain scaling one on one, right? So I'm going to use the example of the most classic example of payment channel. So what is a payment channel is that if you have Alice and Bob trying to send each other money quickly, uh, really quickly, uh, you know, you can do this. You can have like an on-chain bond contract where Alice and Bob both put $10 into it. And then after that, they can just like quickly send each other uh, money by passing back, back and forth uh, something called a balance proof. What this balance proof is, is basically a Mutually signed the agreement saying that among that $20, how much is belonging to Alice and how much is belonging to Bob. And it, in the end of the session, what's going to happen is that Bob can uh, Alice can send this uh, balance proof to this on-chain bond contract. And if uh, you know basically Alice agrees, um, the fund will be distributed uh, according to this mutually agreed bond proof. And uh, uh, it, it is possible that Alice can become malicious and send an older uh, balance proof. You can see that the sequence number is 47, which means that the balance proof is actually, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a older balance proof. And, uh, the, uh, you know, the counterparty can dispute that settlement by submitting a more recent balance proof. And uh, the channel will also settle correctly. And also you can do like multi-hall payment and even more complex stuff on top of this. But this is just a quick refresher of how state channel works in the simplest form of payment channel. So what Seller Network is, is a coherent off-chain scaling architecture. We propose a complete layered technology architecture and also a economic construct. Uh, for the technology architecture, uh, I'm not going to go through each of the detail here, but just a quick intro that we introduced in the lowest layer, we have this something called C channel that is enabling not only off-chain super fast millisecond level payment, but also enabling off-chain smart contracts transactions. And on top of a C channel, we build a, a extremely high performance, uh, uh, you know, provably uh, uh, optimal routing algorithm that can route your payment instantly and with uh, about 15 to 20 times higher performance than existing solutions. And on top of that, we build something called COS, which is a SDK and effectively a runtime system for the off-chain application to run. And that is kind of like the SDK we release. And if you uh, have an Android phone, download that app, that is basically an instantiation or a reference design for the COS. But today, I'm going to talk more on the off-chain sca uh, off scaling's economic construct part. So, um, Off-chain scaling has a lot of promises uh, to increase uh, uh, the speed of transaction, but there are several crucial challenges. For example, uh, th there are three challenges I'm going to talk about today, and I'm, I'm going to talk through each of the challenge and the corresponding solution that we are proposing in Seller. So the first challenge I want to talk about is called state availability challenge. Uh, you know, come back to the same, uh, example of like a payment channel. Let's say you have two party and on-chain bond contract. The most recent state proof that is uh, mutually signed is numbered with 49, right? So uh, now in state channel application or state channel platforms, there is a kind of an unrealistic assumption saying that you have to have every party online all the time, but it, it, it simply cannot be true. So let's say if someone goes offline, what's happen what happens now? You know, uh, uh, Alice can become malicious and try to settle a state proof that is older but more favorable to Alice, and therefore Bob will suffer loss in this case. Uh, there has been the, uh, the very initial work to solve this problem is to use a centralized monitoring service, which is a bad solution because it, the centralized monitoring service has a very strong incentive to collude with the malicious counterparty. 
And what about the trust-free monitoring service? Uh, some work also is uh, mentioning and uh, you know, trying to solve this using a trust-free monitor monitoring services. Uh, well, the trust-free monitoring services uh, look like, at least in the initial form, like this. So there is a third party who is like a watchtower that is uh, helping you to monitor the state. And uh, uh, when you're going offline or doing periodically checkpointing, uh, you just submit your state to this uh, third party. Now, the, the difference between the centralized or trust-based monitoring service of, uh, with this is that for this watchtower, it will also deposit like a, a trust bond or honesty bond to a contract. Uh, now, if the analysts become malicious and try to settle a uh, older state proof, uh, this uh, uh, trust-free service is supposed to submit the most recent state proof for you on your behalf. If it doesn't do that, uh, you can like uh, claim the honesty bond that it put down on the blockchain later when you come back online because you have the capability to attri attribute the fault to this uh, uh, you know uh, watchtower basically. However. These trust-free monitoring services also have very significant disadvantages. First of all, it doubles the liquidity requirement for state channel network, right? So now it's not only the participant who needs to lock up liquidity in the system, but also the watchtowers or monitoring services also need to lock up liquidity. And in the worst case, it actually doubles the liquidity lockup for this entire system. And it provides a very heterogeneous interface for state guarding because uh, you, know, you can have a different kind of asset. You can have Ethereum, you can have Bitcoin, you can, you can have a different kind of ERC-20 token. The corresponding asset that needed to hold in this honest bond, honest bond contract is very diverse. And sometimes it's not even payment. It's something like an intermediate state of some, uh, of some state transitions, like a game. And it's, it's even harder to figure out what is the actual underlying uh, possible cost if uh, a malicious party try to settle against you. And uh, it, it is very obscure and expensive pricing model for the services because uh, uh, you, know, uh, you need to kind of uh, pairwise negotiate with the service provider what is the pr service pricing. And also uh, the, the liquidity lockup makes the service inherently very expensive. And it involves very complex on-chain, off-chain uh, interactions. And uh, finally, it provides a a very, very rigid insurance model where you get X percent back with Y price if the bad things happen, and basically if the, uh, if the watchtower goes away. So to solve all these challenges, we propose the Sellers State Guardian Network. So what State Guardian Network is doing here is a special kind of sidechain. And you stake Seller token into this sidechain and become a State Guardian. Now, when you're going offline or as an IoT device trying to periodically checkpointing the states, uh, you will just uh, submit your state to the sidechain uh, along with the payment. Uh, it's basically, uh, say, uh, let's say Bob pay is paying the State Guardian Network $5 for five hours, and that is $1 per hour income. And the first question to answer is uh, how many State Guardians will be guarding the state for Bob, right? So, um, that is decided uh, very efficiently based on. Bob's income flow injection to this network versus the entire network's income flow. Let's say this entire net network is receiving income of $2 per hour and Bob is paying $1 per hour. Then roughly randomly selected half of the state guardians will be guarding the state for, the, for Bob. And of course, uh, each of the state guardian here is, is not like a, a uniform. Uh, some state guardian may have more seller token, and therefore they are more likely to be selected in this guarding process and therefore receive more fees, uh, statistically speaking. And what this is really enabling is that it can uh, you know, provide a very uniform interface uh, for state guarding, that the state guardian no longer cares what is the underlying state that is at stake. Right, so uh, it can be a game state, it can be a payment state, it can be all sorts of state. Uh, as long as like, uh, uh, you're paying the state guardian corresponding uh, you know, fee, uh, uh, the, the, the corresponding number of state guardian will be guarding the state for you. Now, in operation, what this looks like is that, let's say Alice become malicious and try to settle a state on the uh, state channel contract, then after the challenge period starts, um, each of the guarded state guardian will be randomly assigned with a dispute slot. And, and this is a design to enable collusion resistant among all these randomly selected state guardians. So let's say the first state guardian who is uh, uh, supposed to report in the first slot didn't do it, 
And the second uh, state guardian does that. What's going to happen is that the first guardian will be kicked out of the state guardian network, and also the seller token stake will be slashed. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, his fee and seller token will all be given back to the second state guardian who is like doing an honest job. So with this construct, as long as there is a one state guardian in this entire randomly selected set that is not malicious, the user's state is safe. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what if, uh, you know, all state guardians are actually malicious? What if the worst come to worst? Uh, then what's going to happen is that when the user later comes online, uh, it, it can submit a, a still a attribution of malicious behavior because after all this is side chain, so the user can submit and prove to the main chain that he has already submitted the state to the side chain uh, early on. And uh, all the state guardians who are malicious will be kicked out of the state guardian network and the user will be compensated back with the seller token stake. So with this construct, what this uh, really enables is uh, uh, a very flexible insurance model, right? So uh, now it's user's choice to pay a certain amount of uh, money for the guardian services so that basically a certain amount of the seller token is uh, guarding it for, for him. And what is the seller token in a state guardian network is representing an income flow, basically. So now the user is not saying that, okay, I'm paying you X to get Y percent back. Instead, the user is saying that, okay, I'm paying this level of fee. And in the worst case, I can get seller token back. And ignoring all the frictions, I can stake seller token and become state guardian and recover my loss. So here, it, it, it creates this new market dynamic that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the user is insuring with the, the property of how fast he recovers the loss, the potential loss. So this is like a kind of a quick overview of uh, state guardian networks uh, uh, usage in solving the state availability problem. Now the next challenge in uh, off-chain economic design or off-chain economic security design is called the connectivity challenge. So let's say Alice and Bob is playing a chess in a state channel and there is some payment that is conditionally depends on the result of the state. Um, and uh, Alice is trying to make a winning move in the state channel, uh, in the state channel application. And uh, you know, Bob is just rage quitting because like this is a winning move. If Bob signs the same state, uh, you know, he will be losing the game and therefore the state. So Bob is like just basically rage quitting. So now can we just in this case punish Bob in some way? Well, the problem is that we cannot because there's no way for Alice or Bob to prove to the blockchain that, uh, or, or to, to let the blockchain differentiate among these three scenarios. The first scenario is, uh, you know, Bob rich quitting. The second scenario is Alice is trying to be malicious and uh, without sending the state proof to Bob and directly goes to the blockchain and try to settle the state. And the third scenario is that it is actually no one's fault. It's just that the network is somehow disconnected uh, between Bob and Alice, even though they have some connectivity uh, in other places. So to solve this connectivity challenge, we need a fallback data exchange fabric that is reasonably available to all participants in the state channel applications. And it has the attribution capability of availability time that is saying that, okay, I have actually put this state into this uh, you know, uh, data exchange fabric. It's just you haven't received it yet. And third, it needs to be cost effective. And fourth, it doesn't require a large amount of resources from the end users. So, we can use the underlying blockchain as a data availability service. So how to do that is that you can just submit your state proof into it. It's definitely reasonably available. It's like reasonably available for everyone. It has a very reliable attribution of availability. But the problem is that uh, it incurs permanent on-chain storage. Therefore, it is very expensive. And uh, you know, it actually requires end user to have ON monitoring capability to keep monitoring the states to see uh, who has like a dispute against him. So, we actually, you know, uh, write on SGN for a second time using SGN as a data availability service. So it is reasonably available that because it is sidechain, we can like reasonably agree that everyone has access to this uh, SGN, uh, State Guardian Network. It has attribution of availability time because there is a constant, uh, uh, you know, block rule that gets committed to the main chain. Uh, it is very cheap off-chain storage. And the storage construct can be very flexible that, uh, you know, we can actually construct a 
continuous the state pruning side chain because uh, not all the state is actually going to be there permanently. And it requires all uh, log and monitoring. This is also something that we uh, did very recently uh, in research that is a, uh, you know, kind of a reusing the plasma cache construct that is for every, uh, you know, off-chain smart contract, we have a kind of a leaf node in the, in the sparse Merkle tree. And you can have the capability to only store all log and uh, state for each of the user monitoring its own corresponding uh, states. So uh, how it works is that uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, whenever which party goes offline, uh, Alice will just submit the state proof to the state guardian network and wait for the timeout. In the case that Alice is actually malicious and trying to settle a state, uh, you know, against Bob, Bob will actually respond to the state challenge in the state guardian network as well under the same Merkle tree leaf. And uh, um, uh, if, if it is really the case that uh, like Bob is rich quitting here, uh, after submitting it to the sidechain and waited for the timeout, uh, Alice here will actually trigger a one-bit claim challenge with a uh, uh, money bond on the main chain. Basically, without actually deploying all the complex logic uh, of the, for example, a, a chess game on the blockchain, basically saying that uh, I win the chess and like a very, very tiny state will be put on chain and also with a bond to challenge. Now, uh, because of this uh, state guardian network existence, even if Bob here is uh, responding to the challenge with also money bond, what's gonna happen is that uh, Alice can therefore uh, get the state availability attestation from the side chain uh, to the main chain and therefore the challenge will uh, judge uh, you know, Bob to be losing the challenge. So basically, this using this uh, uh, side chain as a data availability, uh, sorry, data connectivity fallback uh, layer, uh, we can actually uh, have a relatively reliable attribution mechanism uh, for this data connectivity challenge uh, in this uh, in off-chain uh, scaling platform. So. Uh, just to summarize that we just talked about the State of Guardian Network, which is a compact sidechain. It has decentralized trust. It, uh, we have the collusion resistant mechanism built in uh, so that run, uh, only if all the selected State Guardian is actually, are, are actually malicious, um, the user's uh, stake will be at risk. And it provides a very simple and unified interface. There's no additional liquidity lockup in this entire process because people are locking up the seller token instead of the actual liquidity. And third token is denominated as kind of like a, a, a income flow uh, or future income flow uh, for this um, state guardian to do work. So uh, the seller token here is working like a work authorization token. And, uh, you know, it uh, enables a very flexible economic dynamic and very efficient service pricing. And because, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's just a, a one direction uh, price deciding factor that is okay. I'm submitting my state to this uh, state guardian network and I can choose whatever price I want to the level that enough state guardian will be covering for my state. And it can also be used as a data connectivity, fab uh, connect data connectivity fabric uh, to solve the data connectivity challenge. So, Another thing we want to talk about is uh, called the network liquidity problem. So in this uh, uh, state, uh, state channel uh, applications, uh, you know, to establish state channel, you need to have like an on-chain bond deposit, right? So it is fine for end users to do that because for end user, as long as uh, it is opening a state channel, uh, you know, the money is uh, his, he will just uh, like a deposit uh, the bond into the state channel. Now, it is actually pretty hard uh, for a off-chain service provider, which is like the blue dot here, to source all these capitals to open a lot of channel with a lot of uh, uh, end users. So this uh, problem is uh, quite challenging because uh, for many people who has the capability to run a uh, off -chain, reliable off-chain service infrastructure, they may not have the enough liquidity to do so. Uh, for people who have uh, uh, enough liquidity, they may not have the business interest or the technical capability to run that service. And that mismatch is actually causing a very slow adoption to this entire uh, architecture. And uh, you know, finally, what this is gonna result into is basically we create a huge centralization risk where poor services are gonna result, a very expensive service is gonna uh, as a re uh, happen as a result. There's no neutrality and a strong possibility of censorship and there's like a, a very closed system for the evolution. So we need to solve that problem. Okay, so uh, we need liquidity, but liquidity has to come from somewhere, 
right? So how about we figure out a way to incentive people to lock up liquidity into the system for a long period of time? To, 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 to enable that uh, capability or to enable that possibility, we introduced something called a proof of liquidity committed mining. And for proof of liquidity committed mining is kind of like a virtual mining process where you say that, okay, I'm willing to lock up 10 ETH for three years uh, for nothing but, uh, you know, for this process of backing seller networks, a potential liquidity thing. And someone is locking up like a, some other amount of ETH for a certain amount of years. And uh, the new, uh, new, there will be newly generated seller token will be distributed proportionally to the virtual mining power. Now, what is the virtual mining power is basically a product of the amount of liquidity and also the time commitment. So, uh, you know, basically, uh, if, uh, if, if you're, you have a long time of commitment and also a, long, uh, a large amount of liquidity committed to the seller network, uh, you will have a larger um, uh, mining power and therefore getting more and more uh, newly generated seller token. And now we have a stable and abundant liquidity pool locked in for seller. Let's try to use them, right? So let's, how, uh, let's try to use them. So to use them, we introduce some mechanism called the liquidity backing auction. So what liquidity backing auction really is, is a mechanism for the uh, option service provider to crowd source liquidity. Right, so for example, an option service provider may say, okay, I need 100 ETH for 30 days with maximal acceptable interest rate of 1%, and people can just bid on this contract. Right, so someone will say, okay, I'm waiting to lend you 100 ETH for 0.5% uh, you know, of interest rate, and uh, I have 10 seller token I'm waiting to log in into this process. Someone is saying, okay, I'm, I'm waiting to like, lend you this uh, for 1% of uh, uh, interest rate, and someone else may say, okay, I'm willing to lend you uh, 0.5, which is the same as like, the first guy, uh, but has uh, you know, uh, more seller token, it is waiting to, uh, he's waiting to stake or locked into this uh, uh, auction process. Now what's gonna happen is that we'll rank it by uh, the interest rate, of course, first, because uh, we need to be incentive compatible for this option service provider who wants to select the lowest interest rate. But we also want to have a way in this liquidity backing auction process to uh, reward the uh, people who have contributed the liquidity in the first place. So the, we were actually introducing something called the second score auction that is taking into account not only the, liquidity, uh, the interest rate ask, but also the amount of seller token one is uh, agreeing to staking uh, in this process. In, in the beginning of the seller evolution, this, pre this process will be staking. Uh, when all the seller token is mined uh, during the mining process, uh, this will actually burn seller token. And this is the second score auction so that, you know, the winner of the auction only need to adjust the score to match the loser of the auction. And we have a very detailed game theoretical analysis of the auction process to make sure that it is truthful uh, in the game theoretical sense. So with this, uh, what we basically enabled is the proof of liquidity committed to mining, which is uh, enabling um, people who have free liquidity to uh, mine seller by locking up idle liquidity in this option platform, and therefore incentivize and lock up and create a very abundant and stable liquidity pool. And at the same time, we use the liquidity backing auction process uh, to enable option service provider to crowdsource liquidity. And uh, at the same time, we, we, we treat the seller token here uh, as a role of kind of an airline frequent flyer mileage that like a, uh, it, uh, because they get that because they uh, in the past have been contributing to a stable and abundant liquidity pool. And in this liquidity backing auction process, uh, they are also rewarded because uh, uh, you know, they get a slight higher priority when bidding in this uh, liquidity backing contract. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I didn't mention the security implication for this, uh, but from a high level, uh, it ensures 100% safety for end users because even if the off-chain service provider is hacked, uh, the end user who received the token relayed to them from this option service provider can always ensure that, uh, you know, uh, this token 100% backed by this liquidity backing auction process. So yeah, uh, so that is, uh, you know, if you think about it systematically, 
uh, the proof of liquidity commitment mining and liquidity backing auction here is to lower the barrier to bring on-chain state uh, changes to off-chain state by enabling a more liquid and like easier to operate network. And the state guardian network here, uh, we, uh, which solves the data uh, connectivity and also the state availability problem is a layer that is uh, trying to enable uh, the capability to, capability to safely bring back the states from off-chain to on-chain if necessary. So the entire setters the same economic construct complete this entire off-chain ecosystem by you know, enabling this full circle. So uh, just uh, you know, as a closing remark, that we have uh, uh, released uh, the first uh, uh, you know gateway to Stellar Network SDK, and in this uh, uh, wallet you can actually use instant payment, uh, which uh, today can already be be one thousand now two thousand times faster than on-chain transactions with zero gas fees, and also you can uh, uh, use uh, this for some very fun on-chain uh, sorry off-chain smart contract games. Uh, which is uh, like uh, the first ever support that we support. So, okay. So that's uh, uh, just a, uh, a quick introduction of how we are thinking about off-chain economics, uh, crypto economics, uh, and also the sec especially the security side of things. So uh, any questions? I still have some time. So, you know, any questions you guys want to ask? All right, cool, I guess we're done.